Hello everyone and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar, I am your host as always and joining me this week are two stalwart sons of Heart and Hand as we discuss an excellent result yesterday. What a difference a week makes to the mood. Joining me first of all is Mr Ian Hogg. Pleasure to be here David. And the bus convener from hell, Mr Andy McGowan. Hello folks. You took offence to that, I could tell by your voice. It went very, went very camp, didn't it? It did, it did. He went, he went very Michael Barrymore there. Hello, folks. <laughs> he was clearly Jack fizzing. Swimming pools. Yeah, he was, he was, he was clearly, he was clearly fizzing about that. But yes, what a difference a week makes, gentlemen. This time last week, myself and Martin were sitting here in, in not the best of moods, but two superb results um, over the weekend and, and good performances. Gradually, I think getting better throughout the two matches. Really, um, let's start off on. Uh, at Motherwell, it's the most the, the most recent game in, in mind. Now, Motherwell I have in my head, Andy, is being one of these tricky places to go, but we haven't now, that's 46 league matches without defeat against them but even so, the matches there do tend to be tight, kind of quite hear them, scare them, quite in our faces there was none of that yesterday, Rangers went out and said we're better than you and basically handed them a lesson I was I was surprised at that statistic when it was mentioned on the telly the other day because, as you quite rightly say, you're looking at the fixture list you see for Park Away and you're sitting thinking that's a potential banana skin if we're not on it. You tend to think the same about when Celtic go there. It's a potential for, for a wee slip up here or there. Probably born out of the fact that they've been hyper-physical for, for a couple of years, not so much last year and not so much this year. So um, I, any victory for Park is, is usually hard fought. Uh, well deserved. Um, Motherwell quite a well-run team. I quite like Stephen Robinson as a manager in terms of what he achieves f- for Motherwell. Um, but yeah, yesterday was comprehensive, very very welcome, very uh, promising and heartening as well. So uh, I've taken that every time we go to Fort Park. So long may it continue. Hoggy, one of the things that I think that, with all due respect, the the smaller teams in Scotland who don't have the European experience that we do because they don't get to the, the rounds that we get to. It's not it's not bad luck, it's a lack of ability. But uh, Motherwell did have to face what we face, the, the Thursday-Sunday thing. And they were away on Wednesday and uh, Thursday night. They got scudded. Um, they didn't handle, in my opinion, playing th- late Thursday night, travelling back, playing 12 o'clock on a Sunday, whereas Rangers are so used to it, they just breezed past it. Yeah, uh, that was always going to be, that was always my hope. Um, I shared with you yesterday, David, after 40 seconds, I was thinking, woe is us, as Alfredo Morelos missed a chance. There's scar tissue for you. But before the game, you are hoping that, right, we're going to handle it because we've been around the block in Europe. Uh, how many times over the past few, past couple of seasons? Loads and loads of them. Whereas they've got to go to Israel, uh, technically, not in Europe. Uh, they take a chasing. They will be knackered. So you got to hope that either they're going to do one or two things, they're going to play the same team and they're going to be knackered after an hour or they're going to make some changes and effectively devalue the team. Um, so, and I think to be blunt, after we went 1-0 up, Stephen Robinson said it himself, after we went 1-0 up, his team looked dead in their feet and, and, and they, they looked beaten at that point already. It's all right saying that though, Andy. It's all right having an opposition who maybe aren't as on it as they they normally are, but you still have to take advantage of that. Uh, you, you, nobody hands you it. You know, Motherwell were still organised. They still were a team that that know their shape really well. They know each other really well, and they still have a very good goalkeeper. So, had Rangers not turned up yesterday, we might have been sucked into one of those games that we've seen all too often. That's scrappy, a lack of quality. There was none of that from Rangers. Whether it was bringing the ball out of defence, whether it was midfield, where all three of them won their battles comprehensively, whether it was wide, whether it was up front. Rangers players just took to the, the field and said, now nah, we're having this today. And even the substitutes when they came on all wanted to make an impression. It was just, I thought, a really impressive performance. Aye, because what I've liked about Rangers this year and, and probably what disappointed me at Easter Road last week so much is we, we've controlled games to the point where we've neutralised the physicality of other teams. They just they kind of get near us, to be quite honest with you. And you watch a lot of the games and, uh, and you'll see that, that the, the ball 
is usually so far from the opposition player that they can't even make contact with the Rangers players. It's something that we've, we've been very, very good at this year. We've just been so in control and uh, purposeful on the ball. Um, teams like Motherwell just haven't been able to to get in our faces. And I, and I take on board what you're saying, Hoggy, about going to Israel and everything else, but th- that's going to be tempered with the fact that their natural adrenaline of uh, playing Rangers, as every team in the league usually has, that's the extra 10, 15, 20% that they, they somehow find when they're playing Rangers should compensate for it. But I, I just don't think that they can use that as an excuse. And to be fair to Robinson as well, he, he can alluded to it. We were so good yesterday that from, from the first minute to last, they, they couldn't get in the game whatsoever. So even if they hadn't been playing on Thursday, um, I think we would have probably went to town on them. That, that was how good the performance was yesterday. And, and again, I'm hoping this becomes a continued trait, the kind of control, absolute control of the game, usually from Davis, Kamara, Jack in the middle of the park. And I think that's the, the kind of fulcrum of which protecting the defence and actually allowing the forwards to do what they do as well. So, no, I think it was a, a complete performance, really. So Rangers finally were awarded a penalty in the league uh, almost a year after the last one, uh, although by the reaction you would assume that, that Rangers were handed four every single week. Uh, the first one, I have absolutely, I, I don't understand why there's discussion about it. His arm is out. I don't care whether you know, he said he was trying to remove his arm from it. Well, tough. Um, it's a right angle to his body. The ball hits him on the arm. Hoggy, it's a penalty kick. The only thing he didn't do was catch it. Yeah, I mean, um, he punches the ball away. It's it's a penalty. There's a big Ferrari about it. I saw the same online where, you know, um, Michael Stewart, who is slowly but surely trying to basically invent himself as a poor man's Chris Sutton, and that's saying something, um, tells us it's, it's controversial. It's never a penalty. And in his view, it's never a penalty because he dislikes the laws. Right, let's separate these two things out. With the current laws of the game, it's a stick-on penalty. If you disagree with the laws of the game, um, Zurich's that way, Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's because folk think it's a controversial season or, you know, they've got to play it up somehow. You don't. It's an important season. Everyone gets it. But this shock jock on BBC TV, I should say that you know we uh, those who pay their license fees and and I still do. I I pay for this chump to be on TV to give expert analytical advice or or uh, analysis, David. If you don't know the laws of the game, and you're being presented as an expert, you should bloody well learn them, or you're basically just being a fud for the sake of it. Um, I watched sports scene, uh, but I recorded it, watched it late last night. There was many penalties, or there were many penalties given across the SPFL uh, over the weekend, David. Do you want to hazard a guess at the two that Michael Stewart didn't think were penalties? Mm. No, exactly. I, I think that, look, anything can be controversial if you decide to make it so. And if you're going to take perfectly reasonable decisions and suggest that they're not, then there's no point. I mean, I, I think we live in a kind of post-fact world anyway um, where, where people don't really bother with what the truth is. Uh, and I think he's a, a great example of somebody who thinks if I believe something, that's enough. I don't need evidence. I don't need to know. I don't need knowledge. It's it's enough just to, to say it. And so long as I feel it, it's true. Uh, as Hoggy mentions there, Andy, the, the rules about the penalties, we are seeing debates all over. There was a lot of it in England, for example. And people don't like the current laws. That is fine. I don't like the current laws. But that's a separate discussion from whether or not it is a penalty. It, under the current laws, nothing. there's nothing in there about deliberate. Nothing at all. It's Does it fit the current criteria for a penalty? And both of them did. It really is that simple. So that's a standpoint, the rules. And I, and I honestly it's think... It's a good that, one, aye, aye, aye. Well, about that, that, we're saying that. I honestly don't think Michael Stewart knows the rules. Because if he did, he wouldn't be talking so much shit on TV. He doesn't TV. want to know them. That, that, uh, that's the point. It, it, and a lot of these experts do that. They they, they don't care. 
they're like, yeah, but I don't think that should be the rule. Well, no offence, that doesn't fucking matter. Um, whether what you think matters, not one iota. But as Hoggy mentioned, he's been brought in for his expertise. Um, and, and it's not just him, it's, it happens across the board, where it, they're not asking you whether you like a rule. That's a completely separate thing. They're asking you, is that a penalty? And under the laws of the game, you can't go, well, no, because I don't believe it is. That That's just silly. That's a wee bit like saying, well, you know, I don't think I should have to follow this particular law of the land. Try that in front of a judge. They tend to say, I don't care. No, I agree completely. But if we look at the penalties, so the first one um, boils down to this new kind of the, the silhouette thing that's often mentioned. What is the silhouette? So one of the things that's come out of the fact that a lot of this happened in England this week is there's been a lot of chat online today with clarification on that. And, and for what I found was that a silhouette is... It's basically arms close to your body, similar to as if you were you were standing up straight. So that boy yesterday had his arms out, and it was blocking it, and and it would have went further past him if he hadn't had his hands out for his way. So that's apparently the second one, right? And this, if you think Michael Stewart's controversy, which he this, the second one I thought was apparently yesterday because he had his hands up and it was a deliberate motion up the way, maybe no deliberate intent to touch the ball, but a deliberate mo- motion upwards. According to what I'm reading today, it might not have been apparently because his body's within his his arms are within the silhouette of his body, if you know what I mean. So no, if his arm because he it, moves his yeah, but because he moves his hand towards the body, even if delib- it, yeah, yeah, that's right. that's where that's where it will not deliberate's not a word that's in it, but yeah, even in within yourself, because imagine if someday, otherwise you could put your hands together, you know, in front of your stomach and basically catch the ball and say, but look. You know, the, the, my arms are down by my side. So the fact that he's arm moved... Look, I agree, it's a shit rule. It is a shit rule. I don't like it. I want to go back to the days when the only penalty you ever saw for handball was when Anton Rogan was playing. And he <laughs> used to fucking catch it, right? And we all knew where we were with it. I don't like watching, you know, the Tottenham Newcastle and in the last minute the ball gets headed off a guy's arm and it's a penalty. I agree, it's a shit rule. But it is the rule. And as Hoggy said, if you don't like it, then, you know... Head, head to Switzerland and, and have a word with them. But uh, they were penalties. They were both dispatched by James Tavernier, back on penalty kicks. And I thought, Hoggy, that, that that was in keeping with what was a terrific display from him. Big time confidence player, as we know, and um, scores his penalty on Thursday night, expertly, I uh, should say, straight down the middle. Um, first one yesterday, right into the corner. Keeper, I mean, the keeper went the right way. And Trevor Carson, I think, despite him shipping five goals. I think he's a really, really good quality keeper. Um, but he's he's still a mile away from it because it's, you know, it's an off the post. It's, it's a great finish. Second one, I think there was a bit of, as we discussed yesterday on, on the, the post-match, David, there was almost a bit of Carson waiting to see where it was going to go and is it going to go down the middle. And when you do that, and if it's in the corner, you ain't getting to it anyway. So both, both you know, put away expertly, as I say, James Tavernier, we all know it, he's a confidence player. And yesterday, by God, his confidence was up there because he was sensational. Um, really, really sensational. Up and down that park. Um, complimented on the other side by uh, Shirley Bassey, who incidentally, the last chance of the game was a Bassey cross into the head of James Tavernier. That was for me just the whole game on it, uh, on it from first minute to last. It was, uh, it was sensational from James Tavernier. Andy, uh, I agree with what Hoggy says about confidence player, but yesterday was the sort of thing you want from a Rangers captain where it was leadership of the sort of leading from the front and being involved in everything. And there was one moment in the first half where he was he was actually pressing down on Trevor Carson and winning the ball back that high up the field. Uh, solid defensively, didn't have too much to do, but, but did that. But in terms of just as an example yesterday, I thought that I was... Sitting there saying, no, yeah, that that's what you want to see from a captain every week. If anybody that's listened to me on this podcast knows that I'm a, a huge Tavernier fan. I've defended him. I didn't think he should have been off penalties last year. I thought it was a bit of a farce that whole episode. He was by far our best penalty taker. He'd been there, done it, and because he missed a couple, doesn't mean that he all of a sudden lose that. And yesterday, uh, I, I think we started to take it for granted. I think we start to take for granted what James Tavernier does, how robust, how physically uh, incredible he is in terms of being able to play consistently week in, week out in the most physical league in Scotland, what we ask of him. 
And and I think we've also got a wee bit of a thing about what is a captain, what is a Rangers captain, because he gets this kind of thing levelled up, and he's no, I don't know what we're expecting. Terry Butcher kicking in doors, but Stephen Davis used to get it when he was a captain as well. He's no shouting off, he's no doing this, he's no doing that. What a captain nowadays in modern football is totally different from what we were growing up with. Um, and I think Tavernier is the exemplar for anybody that joins your squad in terms of how he conducts his sale, how he conducts his sale in the park, um, the the level of kind of consistency that he's expected. Because let's face it, when he's a poor game, the kind of knives come out a wee bit. If you look on social media, you get all the usual crap about him and he's crossing. His, his numbers and his statistics are absolutely unparalleled. And... Uh, I, I really don't get any criticism. I'm not saying he's above criticism, but I think you've got to take, look at over the piece. Even when we were, he was playing in one of the shittest senior top league Rangers teams, he was always the only guy that I could look to and say, Do you know what, he could be here in a better team because he, what it showed even then when we're getting stuff off Celtic. It was, it was really good yesterday. And, and as you said, Hoggy, the, the fullbacks are obviously an integral part of the way we play nowadays. So it was extremely heartening to see. Um, 90 minutes for Bassi yesterday because I think as I pointed out to you guys yesterday last year Barisic goes out of the team yeah. he would have had Flanagan in that left back position and they had to join Flanagan because he's a, um, a defender first and foremost but he's not going to do what, what uh, we're expecting of our full backs nowadays so it's very very good to see that Barisic who um, is obviously our first choice left back and, and has been except productive We've now got somebody that, you know, there's not going to be that much a drop-off in terms of the domestic game if you bring in Bassey. And there may be an argument that for some real humdum up and up games, Bassey's a wee bit more physical than him because he's, a, he's obviously a unit Bassey. So given that's his first start for Rangers, given that he's, um, he's not actually played that many senior games, if any, in his career, very, very promising. Absolutely fantastic debut. So um, again, another positive among, among many positives yesterday. Cards on the table. Um, we never lie to you here on Heart and Hand. Uh, when I saw the team yesterday, I did go, hmm, um, Bassey and Jones in. Oh, I wonder. And, man, did they shot me up, Ian? They didn't have. I I, I was the same. Um, I thought, oh, well, that's... Uh, maybe Borner's just got that, that wee slight knock that we'd heard about. But to be fair, you know, his previous two performances weren't exactly top draw. He seems to come back after, I think Croatia took a bit of a doing from Portugal in the international break. And we know Borna's a, a confidence player. Maybe that's just impacted him a little bit. So stepping out yesterday, wouldn't, that wouldn't have done him any harm. Um, I wondered where the hell Jordan Jones came from for the, you know, the first time in a year. Well, on Bassey, I, I, you know, we commented on it during the game. Um He's, he's a footballer that I I love to watch young guys playing football the way that he does. He's I think I, I said he was a he's like an eight year old playing football in a welterweight's body. He just loves to play the game with a big smile on his face and he's you know battering folk around the park. I loved his performance yesterday, but I was worried before the game. Jordan Jones, um, he came in on Thursday night. I thought he did ever so well, having been out for however many months, uh, I thought he really came on, showed up, took the game to Villain Tway at a point when we were kind of starting to lull a little bit. Gets his start yesterday and by God, he took it, David. And it's it's great to see. I, I want every single player that pulls on a blue jersey to succeed because if every single player succeeds, we succeed. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, Jordan Jones, I thought, would have been out the door last in the winter. I thought he'd be. I thought he'd be gone by now in the summer window. He's been given one last chance, and he's got to take it. And he's by God, he, he really did. He showed up terrifically well yesterday. I think with um, we'll, we'll, we'll start on on Bassey. I think that for me, he's an uncut diamond. He is. He is raw. I mean, absolutely. But you know, the, the people at the club said that when he arrived. It, you know, he's, he's somebody that we're going to have to do a bit of work on, but there's something there, and you can see it. I mean, he's got incredible physical attributes, as we know, but uh, he is he, he is a good player, and I think that there'll be mistakes, there'll be ups and downs, as there are with any young player. We might not see the best of him this season. Might not even be the next season, but he's going to grow into a really, really good player, I think. Jordan Jones, I have to agree with Hoggy there, Andy. I thought 
no, the, the the time is gone. I think that never mind the fans making their mind up about him because that happened, right? The manager seemed to have made his mind up about him. Um, whether or not there were other issues we're not aware of, I don't know. Um, but he just wasn't quoted at all. He would occasionally come in from nowhere to make a bench, but never have, you know, I don't even think got sent for a warm up. However, he, he got his 20 minutes the other night, took it, looked great. Then the manager, who I do think is one of these managers who does look at training and does go, now he's showing up well in training and, and will reward you for that, puts him in yesterday and was rewarded with a goal. I saw a lot of goals over the weekend because it appears nobody in Europe, really Barra's, can defend. But um, I didn't see a better one than, than Jordan Jones's. No, and, and I, I'm a big advocate of Jones. And, and it, you know, you may be saying, you know, Andy, you like everybody, but I thought Jones, when we signed him, was a risk free signing because his stock was high in the Scottish game. We got him in a Bosman. And what was the worst that could happen? He comes and doesn't quite cut it and we sell him for any amount and he'd cover his wages and a wee bit more. So I, I thought at the time we signed him, that's a sensible signing. Since then, um, I watched him against Mitchell and away in the Europa League qualifiers last year and I thought it was utterly dynamite away from him in that game in particular and I thought it showed anybody that uh, wanted to or had any doubts about Jordan Jones this is what he can do and I think after the game Gerard can I say they arrived as a Rangers player that night the the Celtic red card <laughs> now that in itself does not constitute the kind of treatment he's had since then. So there is obviously something that we're no party to that's went on behind the scenes, whether it's his attitude, whether it's his training, I don't know what it is, whether Gerard's going to be disliked him, but there's been something there. Because if there's no something there, what I would be saying is that you've got to question Gerard's management. Because what we had there is a, is an asset, a potential asset that has been more or less no utilised. Um to the point where I, I was saying, well, listen, if you've got Jordan Jones, there is absolutely no way you're telling me he cannot contribute in some form or fashion to our squad over a course of a season. I just couldn't find a, a possible kind of explanation. And I've often talked about my, my ridiculous Velichka concept, which is where you've got a player in oh, your here squad we go. <laughs> who you do, not, you do not rate, per se, and who is never going to be a starter. But all he needs to do is come in and contribute five, ten times over a season with a goal here or there or a good display here or there and that's what gets you over the line in some games that take you towards a title challenge and I've often thought Jones came into that and probably a wee bit more than that because I think he's better than that and and so I was utterly delighted yesterday because the thing that's often levelled against him and other players with pace is that they need no use using that kind of player in the Scottish game because teams sit in, sit in, in, in this kind of low block Adam Thornton's low block um just thwarts that kind of pace in behind, if you like. So th- that kind of dispels it. I know, I know Motherwell were only sitting in yesterday. They actually play far more open than they ever have. But by the same token, you've got to have, um, you've got to take opportunities when they arrive. So what I liked about Jones, what I liked about Jones when he's at Kilmarnock is he hurts teams. And when, I, I mean, I'm talking about other players, Hadji, so on and so forth, they're, they're very, very creative, very creative players and they hurt teams in other ways, but I don't think you can ever beat that kind of raw pace and finish and that's exactly what I see for Jordan Jones. So I think he's played his selling the contention here because oh, you're, looking at, you're looking at the game on Thursday against Galatasaray where you're a little bit at home, you're going to expect to be under pressure, you're going to be expecting a team to come out at you and you've got to think, well, if you Kent and Jones, either side of the kind of strikers we're playing, it's a fairly potent kind of counter tank that so I, I think it's a uh, it's as good as a new signing to be quite honest with you. Yay! If he, if he, <laughs> if he uh, uh, you fucking put me off now. If he cliche klaxon, cliche klaxon keeps his attitude in place. So um, yeah, I'm Mister Mister Jordan Jones. I said it on Twitter. I've said it for long enough. I've uh, hit back at snipers and. I'm kind of vindicated by that goal, but he needs to do it for a longer term, I'm quite honest with you. Yeah, he does. But I, I agree. And listen, pace is always going to be a, a weapon against anybody if you can play a ball that Scott Arfield played to him because that was magnificent. That was a stiletto knife just slipped in there. And I thought he had a terrific game yesterday, Scott Arfield. He was just all energy, always available, always involved, linking up the game. It was a, a super display from him. We didn't really have a bad performer yesterday, in all honesty. But... If there was one thing 
at 3-0 that we could have asked for or we, we all hoped for. It was a goal for Cedric Kitten. And when it came, Hoggy, my goodness, was it worth waiting for? I would, though, like to point out that this that's the goal way over. It had been 250 minutes, right? Let's, you know, not even 250 days. Let's not pretend that this has been going on a while. This is a kid who's just arrived, picked up an injury during this kind of six-week spell. And I think that, you know... Mr. Optimistic here had said, look, once he gets one, he'll get he'll get another. First one, a peach, just a beauty. Great touch, it sits up invitingly, and man, does he do well to lash at home. But the second I loved, because yeah, it's not going to go in anybody's end-of-season highlight reel, but it was one of those good, dirty striker finishes, just being there and getting into a bit of confusion, and you being the guy who reacts quickest to steer at home. Pure striking instinct, I loved it. Big Atomic, he's, um, it's the one thing I wanted, you know, he came came off the bench, I think, right, now's the time, we, he actually came off the bench at quite a good time, David, we we had started to just lull just that little bit, and he came on and gave us a wee bit, a wee bit of a spark up front, um, never thought he was going to take that shot on at all, I thought he was going to lay it off for, for James Tavenier, but his first touch just brought it up perfectly in front of him. And there's a clean strike through the ball, flies past Carson, terrific goal from 19 yards. His second is a um, proper striker. It's a proper striker's nose. He uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. A goal that certainly Ali McCoy would have been proud of. Um, so you're 5-0 up, everything's going right, we're getting penalties. Uh, Crocker and Walker are crying into their coffee. Uh, Michael Stewart's sharpening his pencil. We've got great goal from uh, Jordan Jones, two for Cedric Itton. It's It was turning out just to be that perfect day, David. Um, until, of course, we forgot to put someone on the post towards the end, I'm sure we'll cover. But it was it, Itton's goals were just so far apart each other in terms of finishes. But I, I, I love both of them. Uh, the, the first strike was great. The second strike was just right place at the right time. See, the, see yeah. the second one. See the second one. I mean, I, I know it was right place at the right time because he's in between the sticks. But see if you go back and watch it. Watch his movement for the penalty. Yes. Because what he does with the centre half is he does this classic kind of something you can't teach. This is an a striker's instinct. It does a wee feint to the left. And it, that just gives him that split, split second to get in front of the guy, and he's left him for dead. And then when the ball comes in, he's at the front post. So that, that to me, I said to my pal, I says, look, he's a natural goal scorer, because you kind of teach that. That's the kind of thing McCoy's void, all these players that we love for being penalty box players just today. But I think he's getting more than just being a penalty box player, because, as you've seen for the first strike, he can obviously shoot, he's got height. I think, oh, it's early days, you can't tell too much for what, for what we've seen, but... There's a reason that Rangers went out and spent that kind of dough on him. He looks to be very well liked amongst the squad if you look at the reaction to his goals. So I think yesterday just came at a perfect time for him because we've got so many options now. I mean, we're near roof yesterday, for example. He's still no, in that squad line. We were missing a hell of a, a chunk of guys you would consider first teamers Roof, Hadji, um, Aribo, Borna, Ryan Jack. You know, the, the, the good players who will not only have a part to play, but a big important part to play. So it, it, it was all very heartening indeed. And in terms of that own goal, not going to concentrate too much in that, to be honest, Ian, because um, I think George's head got turned by that porn star lady um, who's been tweeting him. Uh, probably not the first clean sheet she's ruined, in all honesty. But uh, we will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. What I did like about it, Oggy, was if you watch that goal back, you know, I don't like watching Rangers, goals against Rangers back, but Hadji, Arfield, two or three others are raging. And I love that. They're 5 0 up with a couple of minutes to go, and they're all raging, including the attacking players, because the clean sheet's gone. I like that. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, you look at Edmison looked distraught. For a, for a couple of minutes um, Georgia should have been on the post mate and then your header wouldn't have gone past you uh, but yeah they were they were angry because they wanted the clean sheet because they don't want to concede goals um, there's so many leagues across Europe at the minute where folks seem to have forgotten how the hell to, to defend and we're raging because it's 5-1 we've, what is it 20 goals in 5 games we've scored something like that something ridiculous um, and we give away a couple last week, of course, and we give away one yesterday. 
I th- I think there's green shoots there of a togetherness in that squad that you've only got to look at Itton's first goal and the squad, the players in the park couldn't have been more pleased for him. And then we're raging when we lose a goal. And there was one other point as well where O'Hara strikes a free kick. It's a cracking free kick, incidentally. Uh, McGregor tips it onto the crossbar and up and over. And he's got to be the only goalkeeper in the world that wouldn't take the praise for that. <laughs> Not only was he screaming at the referee, because I never touched it, ref honest. Uh, you did. And then screaming at his defence because clearly it's their fault. Um, mm. That's just, yeah, we, we are desperate for clean sheets and desperate to play well. Speaking of Alan McGregor, that leads nicely on to Thursday night, Andy. Um, I fancied his. I really did. I thought we would have enough about us. Didn't think that result, though, beforehand. I, I defy anybody to tell me that they did. And look, Willem the, the what we'd heard about them turned out to be true, that they, they were decent going forward, but that they left space at the back to exploit. But Alan McGregor came in, and I think really did prove why, he's, why he is the number one. Uh, undoubtedly, and and I think at the back of my mind, right. So at the start of the start of the season, now we've we've all enjoyed John McLaughlin, and we've obviously enjoyed the the, the record for the clean sheets and the fact that it became a, a thing, as you're saying, Hogan. It's became a, a a goal each game for the team to keep a clean sheet. But at the back of my mind, I still thought McGregor was a number one, and I thought that there was a kind of wee problem in waiting for Gerard in that you're, you've got the Celtic game approaching, and I know we all kind of look at Celtic games and. And look at them in isolation, but you've got the Celtic game in isolation coming up, and I was thinking, well, what are you going to do if you keep McLaughlin in? You kind of drop him because he's keeping clean sheets. Then that means you're playing him at Park Eid because you kind of then all of a sudden bring McGregor in for the cold. That would be just a risk too far in case it backfires. So there was, um, I, I can see the method to why he brought him back in there for for that game. But at the same token, McGregor's going to take the opportunity, and by Christ, he did because that was like. It was nearly back to Werder Bremen kind of style saves, wasn't it? It was absolutely incredible saves. The one at the, one at the end that got ruled out because the boy punched it in, the save just before that, I, I've watched it a, more than a dozen times. I've no idea how he did it. Um, it, 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 it. For me, that's the kind of save that sums up the difference between a very good goalkeeper, which John McLaughlin is, and I'm delighted we've got him, and a great goalkeeper, which Alan McGregor is. The, there's a di- Making the saves that how did he do that? Those saves, that's your top level goalkeepers and that's Alan McGregor for me. Absolutely. And, and so I'm glad he's back in the fold. And, and, and again, as we're talking about Bassey for Barisic, McLaughlin for McGregor, if you're going for a title, that's the kind of minimal drop-off that you want for your, your backup players for specialist positions. So, another positive. Kent on Thursday night, Hoggy, Ryan Kent was you know, giving me sex we he was tremendous and what I love about him is the big games, you can tell he's desperate. You know he's going to be counting down the minutes to Galatasaray and to the, the forthcoming old firm game. And he's just it doesn't matter if, if somebody wins a tackle against him, he gets up and he goes and tries and gets the ball back and he goes at him again and he goes at him again and he goes at him again and I love that attitude. He's a big time player. Um he's a he's a big team player. And some of the stuff we saw on Thursday night from him, you're right, you know, he, he will try stuff, he will lose the ball, but the amount of times that he lost the ball, which wasn't often, he was always back in the faces of them every single time. And that's not just him. There's um, We've talked offline, David, about the difference in Alfredo Morelos. We're seeing the same from, from him, you know, less of the histrionics and more... Maybe it's because he's got a challenge, and he's still here, and he's got challengers now for his his title, if you like, yeah, um, of the man status. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's doing the same as Kent. He's dropping deep. He's linking the play. He's getting the wide players in. Um, Kent on Thursday night was it was just sensational. You know, giving the ball, and you were seeing Ryan Kent with a smile on his face. How often does that happen? It it, it gen, generally doesn't. You know, he's he's a bit of a He's a bit of the kind of mythical Marco Negri at times when, you know, he scores and he still looks in the half. But he's, th- Thursday night, he was tremendous. Big time game. He turns up. He's He wants to be the man. He wants to take on that mantle. Um, and uh, bring it on on Thursday night. You know, we want that Ryan Kent playing. 
Andy, I think we've all been reasonably sanguine about Europe this season. Um, I don't think we've put the, the, the side under a lot of pressure about it. I think we've all felt it'd be good to do well in it, but, you know, league's a priority and that's what we're focused on. However, we have a one-off game at Ibrox. No away goals to worry about, just a one-off tie. And if we win it, we get 10 million quid at least in prize money. Now that we're here, uh, I very, very much want us to win this match. There's credit in the bank for Gerard and his team for what he's achieved in Europe over the last couple of seasons because I think I've said it many a time to go from the, the first round to get into the group stages two seasons in a row. It's quite incredible, quite incredible, especially the first season when you think about what he inherited and, and what how much uh, room we had to make up to get to the level it was required. So there is credit. And I think that we are a wee bit distracted by the fact that uh, the, the league this season just is a added edge. So I think if, if for example, Celtic went out last week and um, whatever, Estonia, wherever they were last week, if they'd went out and we'd went through, you'd be sitting there saying, very well, we're through, and that's great. But, you know, if we're back to Thursday, Sunday, and they don't have that, there's an immediate advantage and quite a significant advantage over six games um, for, for Celtic if that happened. So uh, I agree completely with you, David. That this is a big time game on Thursday. This is the first game I've, I've got to say that I've had the the major itch when I'm like, fuck, I really wish I was going to Ibrox on Thursday because Galatasaray, big, big name, big team, big club, big support. And uh, that's these are the kind of games that you want to be playing. It's, a, it's almost a Champions League level game, to be honest with you, isn't it? So yes. this is the first game I've really thought to myself, I'm missing this. I'm, I'm, I really wanted to go to this and it'd be a fantastic atmosphere and you'd have the buzz about tickets and all the sorts of kind of normal stuff that goes with it. So if, if we don't get through football-wise, no the end of the world, right? But as we've often said, and particularly when we're going to have a COVID-sized hole in our accounts at some point, to get through and, and get that wee bit of bank would be, would be a, a major boost. You never know, it might even be the difference between getting another player in or not. So um, I think we're capable of it. I think um, we should be going in with our, with our tails up. I don't know much about Galatasaray. I know they're star players and such, but um, we, we shouldn't really be fearing anybody. And, and I mean, we're talking about Kent, and Hoggy's, Hoggy's exactly correct about me. Ability-wise, there is not one player even coming close to him in the Scottish game. His ability is fantastic. It's it's the best we've seen at Rangers for a long, long time. And I'm including the, the kind of halcyon days then. He's a fantastic player. He's, he's, he's got that humility as well. So he's not one of these players that thinks, I'm the man and I know I'm the man. Kind of, kind of Gallus Alice. He's, he's absolutely focused. He knows the responsibilities that is on him now as part of your team. And he's starting to rise to it. Um, and it was heartening again. He had a, he's probably a quiet game by his standards yesterday at Fur Park, so it was good to see others step up to the plate. But we talk about Tavernier setting a standard. Kent's the same. He's setting a standard every week as well. Yeah, uh, as Andy alluded to there, Hoggy, you can't earn money like this in Scotland, you know, without player sales. You you can't. There's there's no way to do it. There's nowhere near that level of money, and that's why especially in this year, it would be so good to get through. Equally, I suppose if we don't, there is a bit of you that says, saves us six games, etc, etc. But as we're going, you know, sitting here recording this on the Monday, I'm desperate to to get this victory. Uh, I, I want to go through. You know, I, I'm I'm not the type of Rangers supporter that, that wants to... Uh, that's wrong. I want to prioritise competitions. The league is the be-all and the end-all. But I do not and cannot subscribe to this argument, David, of, ah, well, if we go out, it'll be fine going out as long as we win the league because we're not in control of that. Yeah, not nobody yet. can offer you that. Not nobody yet, can guarantee you know? that, yeah. Um, so, therefore, I want us to go out and win every single game that we play in. And that sounds bloody obvious. It is, right? <laughs> but I want to go out and I want to go as far as we can in every single competition. Um, financially, it's huge. 10 million quid for getting through. Um, 515,000 uh, pounds for every win across the six games. 
So you've got the potential before TV, before all that, you're looking at £13 million in prize money up for grabs just for getting to the group stages. That's vital, I think, for us. If we don't get it, it is not the end of the world. Absolutely not. But to Andy's point, it's, it will slightly curtail what we can do or might mean you know we've got to sell to buy whatever. Getting through on Thursday night will be huge for us. It will be a tough game. You know, Galatasaray have, they seem to have two pots of players, if you like. They've got young, local, homegrown players who are really young. And then you've got effectively a pot of so-called superstars. And incidentally, I think this year, all the feedback is, before the Turkish League started, the, the, the older players hadn't been pulling their weight, particularly, and they kind of slid down the league a little bit. But they've got top names Maybe not top players anymore, but they're, they're, they're going to be very dangerous. Ryan Babel, Radamal Falcao, uh, Jimmy Dermaz. They've got uh, Arda Turan, Turkish midfielder that they've got yeah, from, very, from very Barcelona. Really, really good players. Uh, uh, Maslara, the Uruguayan goalkeeper. These, these are top, in their day, top players. It's whether or not Rangers bring their, their top game, their A game, and whether Galatasaray just come out that little bit and allow us in behind them. If they do, we'll win the game. If we don't, if we don't bring an A game and they play well as a cohesive unit, then it's going to be tough. So it's 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 imperative that our our key players turn up on Thursday night. But you know, don't be under any illusion, David. I want to get through. Andy, I, I think that. You, you you sort of touched on a fairly important point there, which is that, look, there are issues with Rangers domestically over the last couple of seasons. We know that. We, we saw them at Easter Road and, and we've spoken about maybe concerns going forward. We, we know that after Christmas, etc. All of that is true. Equally, in Europe, this this side has earned respect. And the old cliche, yeah, we're going Galatasaray, tough game. They We're not the team they wanted to draw, certainly not away. Absolutely no, and this is where Gerard's um, the Benitez in him is, is is very very apparent apparent because he, from day one he's had a, an absolutely crystal clear vision of how we should be setting up for Europe both home and away, uh, and, he, and invariably he's got it pretty much spot on because if you look at the games that we've lost, you're thinking about Spartak away here, think things like that. It's no been like disastrous, complete balls up that, that we've never been in the game. It's been fine lines, very fine lines, young boys away, stuff like that. So um, his European kind of style and the, the setup has been very conducive to causing problems for opposition teams. And uh, this is where I say there's credit in the bank because I, I think if we went out, it wouldn't be like the old days of Walter or MD where you say off. Oh, we shouldn't be going out or we've never done it in Europe. I think we've kind of earned our chops in Europe to a degree over the last two seasons and and, and that goodwill is there and it doesn't just, just get washed away because I think anybody would recognise that if we do go out, heaven forbid, on Thursday, we've no, it's, it wouldn't be a total shot. Because, no, there's as no I say, disgrace to it, no. Galatas are, are, are a big team and a big European name, so I think uh, I think we all know the, kind of, the balance of that game and if it doesn't fall our way, which can happen then I don't think there'll be too much criticism unless it's a, a, a mauling or something like that. But I don't see that being the case. I think we've got, as you say, Galatasaray have been sent there looking at the same case. This team is informed. They've, they've, they've got a formidable record in the last couple of years at this level of Europe. They'll be delighted that it's an empty eyebrow, so I've got to say. And I'm interested to see how that affects us because that's obviously a, a big, big thing in that our favour. That would have been huge, yeah, yep. I think. So, um, no, it's a, it's a good thing to look forward to. And as I say... If I was gone, then I'd be delighted. But, you know, it's one of those chosen few that get to go to these games nowadays. You had to drop that in, didn't you? <laughs> just, 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 so David people, Graham, listening. just so that people can hate on me. Thank you. Um, but, yeah, I'm Wait. very fortunate that I'm going. But trust me, um, while I'm, you know, very, very just privileged to be going, I wish I was going to my own seat. I wish there was, you know, going to be 49,000 of my mates there. I, I wish they had their away fans, you know. Uh, it would be one of those nights that you never forget. But um, 
but let's let's get the win anyway, Rangers, and let's get through to that next round. Right, folks, that will do us for today. Um, we'll be back next Monday, of course, on the free show. But if you want to hear more from us, please go to our Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash heart and hand, where you can get up to five shows every single day on all things Rangers from just one ninety nine per month, just 50 pence per week. Trust me, we're the best value that's going. And uh, you will, in my opinion, enjoy it. If you enjoy this show, you certainly will. My thanks to the two lads for joining me today. First of all, to Hoggy. Pleasure as always, mate. And to Andy. Pleasure, folks. Thanks for having me on, David. We'll be back next Monday. Till then, have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. 